Hi everyone. How often do you use the word thank you? How often do you send a text message or call someone to express your gratitude? Are you thankful to God for your spouse and your children? Or has the busyness of life caused you to take them for granted? Do you thank God for the joy your children bring to you? Or do you complain that they eat the whole day and are just too noisy? Are you thankful for your job and for your boss at work? Little things like getting your leave approved or being allowed to work from home. Are you thankful for those who give you spiritual oversight and the word of God that they unpack week after week? Are you thankful for the time people set aside to spend with you, specifically you? Are you thankful to God that you don't have difficulty breathing like so many people on ventilators in hospital at the moment? Are you thankful for a roof above your head, food on your table, clothes on your back? Are you thankful that you can read? Being able to read puts you in a better position than close to a billion people in this world. We must cultivate a culture of thankfulness. When last did you receive a message from someone genuinely saying thank you for something you've done? I bet it's few and far between, and when they do come through, it's from the same people all the time. It's easy to identify a thankful person. It comes from something deep within them. Thankful people are selfless. They don't have an attitude of entitlement. They take time to notice things and are appreciative of people, not just gifts. They appreciate your time, advice and friendship. They notice when you do something to help them and they acknowledge the effort that it takes. There is so much that we can be thankful for, yet we often forget to have hearts of gratitude. The Hebrew word for gratitude literally means recognizing the good. How focused are you on recognizing the good in your life? The truth is, we find it so much easier to grumble and complain. Why is it so difficult for us to acknowledge the good? Firstly, it's our affluence. We have stable jobs, drive nice cars and have DSTV or Netflix at our fingertips. We eat at nice restaurants and keep entertained on our smartphones. You would think this would make us the most grateful people on earth, but often it makes us ungrateful and discontent as we always aim for more and never reach a place of contentment. Secondly, it's our pride. We all say, I work hard all my life. I earned my place in society. My ambition and strength brought me to where I am today. With all the me's, my's and I's, there's simply no space to acknowledge the provision and sustenance of God, or the help of anyone else for that matter. Proverbs 27.2 says, Let someone else praise you, and not your own mouth, an outsider, and not your own lips. When we exalt ourselves, gratefulness to God or others becomes secondary. We put ourselves on a pedestal and basically tell the world, I couldn't have done it without me. The reason we may battle to show gratitude is because of the company we keep. If we spend most of our time with grumblers and complainers, chances are it will rub off on us as well. Our judgmental nature also causes us to be unthankful. When someone gives you an expensive gift, do you really value it or do you say, oh, they're rich, they can afford it? Any gift even if it's a second-hand present, demands a thankful heart. Thanksgiving to others starts with our ability to give thanks to God, our Father. Ephesians 5.12 tells us to always give thanks to God for everything. 1 Thessalonians 5 tells us to give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. An attitude of thanksgiving in both times of trials and blessings will distinguish us from the rest of the world. Now, this isn't easy to do. How do we remain thankful even when we're going through a tough time? We must firstly believe that God is in control of everything and that He has our best interests at heart. We must believe that He loves us. 
your situation may look bleak right now, but that's because you're viewing it from one vantage point. Jeremiah 29 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Knowing that God is working all things for your good should make you thankful. Consider your own experience in life. You'll probably find that many of the things you were once upset or complained about makes complete sense now, years later. This could be a relationship that ended or a job that you lost. When we look back and see how far we've come, we understand why certain things took place and then we are thankful. But our posture of thankfulness, even during our trials, is what shows our maturity in the faith. We see numerous accounts in scripture of how people experienced miracles, yet they quickly forgot and started complaining again. The nation of Israel murmured and complained in the wilderness, even when God miraculously rained down provision daily for 40 years. God is not pleased when we don't have hearts of gratitude. We must also teach this principle to our children. We have a generation that feels entitled to everything and show little to no gratitude. As parents, we must teach our children to become serial thanksgivers in their schools, churches and communities. There are so many benefits that come with having hearts of gratitude. Not only is it pleasing to God, but it's been scientifically proven that you'll make more friends and improve your general health and well-being. You'll have a higher self-esteem and writing down a few things you're thankful for every night will even help you sleep better. Research has also shown that gratitude increases your mental strength, making you less likely to suffer from post-traumatic stress and more likely to overcome trauma. So let's look at some ways in which we can express our gratitude. Firstly, you can start with your family. Researcher Dr. Nick Stinnett from the University of Nebraska worked on a project to identify qualities that make for strong families. His team found that the first and most important was the quality of appreciation. Stinnett concluded that families are strong in part because they express their appreciation for what their spouse or children do and for who they are. So, look for reasons to say thank you to those in your family. Then extend that thank you to others. We can start by acknowledging the people who help us every day, from the petrol pump attendant to the shop assistant. Instead of typing TX, take the time to write a heartfelt message to say thank you to someone, to acknowledge their time, gift or resource. If you can, send them a surprise delivery one day without waiting for an occasion. To spoil them. Be specific in expressing your gratitude. It's a good start to say thank you for your help, I appreciate it, but it will mean even more to the person if you let them know what they did and how it made a difference to your life. For example, if they inspired you to get out of your comfort zone, thank them for helping you spring into action and let them know what purpose it served. Give thanks to God daily. Let's not wait for someone to get married or to die to have a thanksgiving service. We've been going through a Bible reading plan and one of the things I've noticed is that the patriarchs like Abraham, Isaac and Jacob consistently stopped, set up an altar and made an offering to God in thanksgiving. Let us give thanks to the Lord by honouring him with our resource and by living a life of gratitude. Gratitude is something that needs to be constantly cultivated. It requires us to rewire our brain so that we notice the blessings around us, be it people, life experiences, or even the weather. But the more we do it, the more we will reap the benefits of it. And so will everyone around us. This week, let's all work harder at developing an attitude of gratitude. Have a great week. Yeah.
sacrifice Crowned as king And Father I adore you I live each day before you And Jesus I love you I give my life to you Are mag- 
magnificent eternally wonderful glory No one ever will compare to Jesus. We worship you, Lord. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me is going to be a really exciting one. And the reason for this is that we have the opportunity to honor the set man, Pastor Justin Naidu and Melanie, who give oversight to our local household of faith, Life Community Church. In 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verses 17, it reads, Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. Take a moment and ponder on a time that Pastor Justin and Melanie has poured into your life. Many of us will soon realize that the advice and counsel, had it not been given by them and put into practice by us, would have led us to a dark and gloomy reality. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 17 it reads, Obey those who rule over you, and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls. And those who must give account, 
let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. We surely have gratitude toward them, which is the quality or feeling of being grateful or thankful. However, honor, on the other hand, is different. The word tamau, which is found in the New Testament for honor, means to fix a value on someone or something. We must come to the place where principles from the Bible, which are taught to us by Pastor Justin and Melanie, are put into practice to overshadow our personal opinions. We are truly humbled by the great sacrifices made by them to ensure that the needs of our local household are well taken care of. Many can attest that the blogs Melanie posts in diaries of a pastor's wife quite regularly leaves us with much food for thought and blesses us all. Both Pastor Justin and Melanie live an exemplary lifestyle. And this is shown through the many sacrifices that they make. Melanie, together with their children, Adriel Benjamin and Gabriella Elizabeth Rhodes, also should partake in this honor as they provide the firm foundation to allow Pastor Justin to do what he needs to do. We are truly grateful that Pastor Justin and Melanie both lead us closer to Christ so that we do not impress but rather express the nature of our Heavenly Father. Here are some practical ways of how we can honor them and their household. Honor their sacrifices and boundaries. Honor them through prayer over their family. We all have received scriptural prayer points that we can use to pray over them and their household as a covering. Honor them financially in the returning of the tithes, offerings, and first fruits. We have been learning about Noah and his family exiting the ark. And in Genesis chapter 8 and verses 20 to 21, we see that Noah had built an altar and it was a sweet smelling aroma to the Lord. This was because Noah offered unto the Lord his superlative best. Honor them through protecting them publicly. Never allow any conversation to be negative regarding the set man and his family. Honor them through the words of encouragement and show appreciation through a video, text, call, WhatsApp, or even a mail. Honor them with a special gift. And this could be by knowing what their favorite hobbies are and their likes and buying something that would bless them and make them feel special. Honor them through practicing and following their leadership. We have learned that doctrine determines practice. Put principles taught by them from the word of God into action in our lives. Honor them through help building their library. Maybe get them a voucher from a Christian bookstore. We can also honor them with the skills and talents that we have to bless the body of Christ. Volunteer to make the load easier and from moving to just lending a hand to giving a shoulder in the ministry. Lastly, honor them always through the love of Christ. I trust that you are blessed and that you will receive impartation from the Holy Spirit to reveal practical ways of how we can honor 
the set man, Pastor Justin, Melanie and their household. God bless you all. Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ on this Sunday morning, the 4th of October. We are already into the 10th month of 2020 and I pray that you and your family are safe. Over the last seven months during the time of lockdown in South Africa, we have been sharing online about Noah and his household. Noah and his family were in a time of quarantine or lockdown and the time came for Noah to exit the ark. And now as many of us would exit and go back into the marketplace, go back to schools, this is indeed a critical time for us. The coronavirus has not completely left us. There are still thousands and thousands of people who are testing positive every day in our country. So I pray that you are keeping safe. But the time has come after lockdown and quarantine for us to reset and for us to reorder our steps, for us to remap 
And I pray today that you and your family are sitting down together, having discussions. If you're a person that lives alone, you're ordering your steps, revisiting, uh, re-auditing the manner in which life was. And now as we've come to a new normal, I pray that you, together with your family, are now beginning to go back to God's original intent and purpose for the earth and for our lives. Well, again, today we are in the book of Genesis chapter 9 and verse number 8. As Noah exited the ark, verse 7 says, Genesis chapter 9, And as for you, Noah, be fruitful and multiply, bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply in it. And as we spoke about in times past, we spoke about fruitfulness. And this fruitfulness is uh, from the perspective and dimension of finances. And many times people would want to pray over finances, but we see prayer as some mystical tool that we use without having any practical dimension to things that we do physically. Remember, God's sovereignty will work with human responsibility. At the beginning of the lockdown under level five, many people were very afraid of the uh, virus, of the COVID-19 virus. But as we went through the different levels of lockdown, that fear of the COVID virus dissipated and many became fearful of losing their livelihoods and their economies. And obviously people like President Ramaphosa together with many cabinet ministers have had to deal with many different issues and bring about a balance uh, in the economy. And for us as sons of God, it is vitally important, it is imperative that we know how to reset ourselves as we exit the ark. As Noah exited the ark, be fruitful and multiply was the mandate given to him by God. Same words given to the son of God, Adam, in the garden. Now today we're going to deal again with the aspect of financial fruitfulness. As a point of departure, let me quote an anonymous uh, quotation which says, and I quote, Wealth is the true test of a man's character. Wealth is the true test of a man's character. Finances, resources and economics play an integral part of all our daily living. It is the controlling factor in many lives, in many homes, and it determines the way our lives are run. In fact, uh, finances and resource for many people can determine how happy they are or at times how depressed they are. Solomon the wise man wrote in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and verse 19 and he, he says, A feast is made for laughter, wine makes merry, but money answers all things. But money answers everything. And for us as sons of God, we have come under the lordship of Christ Jesus. When we receive him and accept him, we accept him not just as savior, but as lord and savior. He is the one who is of supreme authority. So when you say Jesus is my lord, you declare he is supreme authority over my life. That means I come under his lordship and everything that's placed in my hands is now being stewarded or managed on behalf of another. Whether it's 10 rand, 10 million rand or 10 billion rand, the amount does not matter because I am stewarding on behalf of another. When you read the book of Genesis chapter 24, you will read about the servant or the steward in Abraham's house. His name was Eliezer. You can go to Genesis chapter 39 and you'll read about this man called Joseph who was the steward in Potiphar's house. In fact, by the time you get to Genesis chapter 41, Pharaoh is viewing Joseph and Joseph is now stewarding on behalf of Pharaoh. And Pharaoh says in Genesis 41 and verse 38, Can we find one as this, a man in whom is the Spirit of God? 
Joseph's display of the anointing was not involuntary prostration, but it was the fleshing out of wisdom. And we, as sons of God, must manage economies. And if we can manage the micro, then God will place in our hand the macro. Joseph being the case study, he managed the micro well. He was, a, he was faithful in Potiphar's house. He was faithful in his father's house. And then he came to the place of managing the macro, which was the nation of Egypt. Now God takes his son, Adam, and he places his son in a garden. He places his son in an economy. He was put amongst the trees. Genesis 2, 8 will tell us, The Lord planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he formed. The Bible says, And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The garden is a representation of Adam's economy. And the trees there showcase uh, the, the economy that he has. Adam was asked to tend to the garden, tend to the trees that were placed under his care. And we two friends, we have to tend to our economies. We have to tend to that which our father has placed in our hands. The word that was given to Adam, you must keep the garden. You must tend to it. You must protect it. You must guard it. You must be circumspect. That's, the, that's the, uh, one of the purest interpretation of the word keep. You must be circumspect. It is the duty of the gardener to ensure that his economy is fruitful by tending to it, by dressing and keeping it. Now you've got to work your garden, you've got to work your field, and you've got to make sure that goods and services are being rendered. This Adam, as he's placed in the garden, he must work the e economics of his household. And what begins to happen is that the trees then become fruitful. This is very key because Adam now is a gardener. When Jesus is seen uh, by the two ladies after his resurrection, they see him as a gardener. And for us as sons of God, no matter where you are placed, you are a gardener. And you are meant to tend to your garden, to your economy, to your field. And whatever skill that God has placed in your hand, it is your duty to ensure that you are tending to your garden. In John 15, verse number 2, Jesus says, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. By the time you get to verse 5, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit fruit so there's more fruit there's much fruit and there's also in john 15 fruit that remains and i say to us today as sons of god the demand for us in this hour is that we become fruitful one of the things that the coronavirus has done for many of us it has brought us to a place of deep introspection if during the last six and a half to seven months, you have not become more humble, more content, more satisfied with life, then my friend, very little will change our hearts. This time of lockdown and the last six months where we've seen economies literally being decimated has given us the opportunity to reset our value system. And I'm here today to remind us again as sons of God that we too must go back and do a forensic audit of our lifestyles. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 from verse number 6 through to 10, Paul writing to Timothy, he says to his spiritual son, Now godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. There's a very interesting word that the Apostle Paul is using. It is called contentment. 
And in order to become financially fruitful, the demand is that we live with a deep or live in a deep state of contentment. The word contentment means to be sufficient, to be strong enough or possessing enough to need no aid or support, to live independent of external circumstances. To be content means to be content with one's lot, content with one's means at any times, even if it is the most slenderest, you have this inward sufficiency and even in your low times and your high times, you are sufficient. Now Paul writing in Philippians chapter 4 from verse number 11 through to 13, a very, very uh, misquoted out of context scripture. It's quoted a lot, but a lot of the time this portion of scripture is not quoted in its context. Paul writes in Philippians 4.11, it says, Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learnt in whatever state I am to be content. Paul is saying this state of contentment did not come naturally to me. I've had to learn in whatever state I am. I've had to acquire a skill. I've had to acquire much knowledge through studying. If you have to learn, you have to be disciplined. So Paul is saying, I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. Then he says, I know how to be abased. That means I know how to be placed at the, at the bottom. And then he says, I know how to abound, how to be placed at the summit. He says, everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, to abound, that means to have riches, and to suffer need, that means to be in poverty. And then in that context, the apostle says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Paul is saying, in the state of contentment, Philippians 4.11, I've learned in whatever state I am to be content. In the state of contentment, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. To be content is to be joyful and satisfied. It is a state of thanksgiving when you think about all that you are grateful for. So, the demand is, that we need to synchronize godliness and contentment. Because the Bible says, 1 Timothy 6 and verse number 6, Now godliness with contentment is great gain. There must be this harmonizing, this, confer, this conforming, this concurring between godliness and contentment. When you read on in 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 7 says, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into a temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Verse 10 says, For the love of money, not money itself, but the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. And I want to submit to us today that many people have come to the place of destruction. What is this destruction in terms of our 21st century living? This is like sequestration. Paul is saying many people drown themselves, many men drown in destruction. This is where you're pursuing more and more and more and you come to this place where you have nothing. Where the debtor now has to sell off whatever he has to pay the creditors. Now when you go through a sequestration process, it is either voluntarily done or um, there is a compulsory sequestration where creditors are pursuing the debtor. Now, this love of money is the root. The word root is a very interesting word. It is the foundation and it also means that which sources. So the love of money is the foundation of all kinds of evil. The love of money 
is to be covetous. When you read the Bible in Joshua chapter 7, you will read of a man by the name of Achan. And the name Achan is a very interesting name. It means trouble. Here's a man who saw the nation and the army under Joshua's leadership overcome uh, the, the army in Jericho. In Joshua chapter 6, there was a great victory. And Joshua chapter 7, they go after a very small army, a very weak army, and that army is called Ai. And as the army of the Israelites pursue Ai, they lose the battle because this man called Achan was covetous. The Bible says in the book of Joshua chapter 7 and verse 20, Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God, and this is what I've done. When I saw the spoils, a beautiful Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver, a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and took them. This was the lust of the eyes. And there they are, and this is what he says in verse number 21, hidden in the earth, hidden in the foundation. This is the root, hidden in the foundation in the midst of my tent with the silver. That day, the Israelite army was defeated by a weak enemy. One man's covetous nature caused an entire nation to suffer defeat. This is what we even see in South Africa, that people are covetous. They are greedy, wanting more and more to consume on their own lusts, and it leaves a nation in poverty. When you read 2 Kings chapter 5, there was another man who was covetous. His name was Gehazi. Gehazi was in line for a quadruple measure of the anointing. Gehazi was the servant of Elisha who received the double portion from Elijah. And Gehazi would have seen and noted all the miracles that Elisha had performed. In fact, in 2 Kings 5, a miracle took place right before his eyes when Naaman was healed of leprosy. And in verse number 21, the Bible says, So Gehazi pursued Naaman. Naaman, in the context of these verses, had offered Elisha a gift. Elisha rejects the gift because he didn't want Naaman to think he could pay for his healing. But Gehazi saw the gifts. And the Bible says, it uses a wonderful word, Gehazi pursued Naaman. This is what we do sometimes as sons of God. We pursue wealth. We pursue riches. It wasn't Naaman that Gehazi was pursuing. It was what he had in his hand. And the word pursue in the original Hebrew is the word radaf. It means to hunt. It means to, uh, as a hunter goes after a prey, to go after it and defeat it. The Bible says he pursued Naaman. And when Naaman saw him running after him, he got down from the chariot and said to him, Is all well? And he said, All is well. My master has sent me. Indeed, just now two young men of the sons of the prophets have come to me from the mountains of Ephraim. Please give me or give them a talent of silver and two changes of garment. Later on, you would read about Elisha then asking Gehazi, Where have you been? In verse 25, Elisha says to him, Where did you go, Gehazi? And he said, Your servant did not go anywhere. Then he said, Did not my heart go with you when the men turned back from his chariot to meet you? And this is what he's asking him. Because in the context of the cult, it was not time to receive gifts. And he says, Is it time to receive money and receive clothing, olive groves and vineyards, sheep and oxen, male and female servants? And verse 27 is critical. He says to him, Therefore, the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and your descendants forever. And your descendants forever. One person's greed affected generations to come. One man's covetous nature affected generations to come. We see this happening even today when one generation leaves debt, 
When one generation is covetous, mismanages, cannot steward what is in their hand, generations afterward will be left in debt. I pray today that we would have a reverential awe for the things that God has placed in our hand. When you read about the man called Judas, who was one of the twelve and walked with the Lord Jesus Christ, we find that Judas' love for money betrayed the source of money, who is Christ Jesus. Our love for money, beloved friends, must not betray the source of money, who is the Lord Jesus Christ. In understanding the purpose of money, we must understand the principle of first things. And we've got to come to the place of understanding the purpose of wealth and resource. If we're going to be fruitful in this season, we have to understand why God would place resource in our hand. When there is no clear understanding of purpose, abuse is inevitable. When we have no clear understanding of why God would place resource in our hand, we will abuse that which he has given to us. What we do with our money first will determine how long it will last. In fact, what we do first will determine what will happen last. We live in a cyclical, circular realm where everything is connected. And if we could realize that all our actions on the earth concerning wealth and resources is connected, then we will be more prudent in the manner in which we control or handle it. But I say to us today, it is imperative, it is critical that we understand the principle of first things. The nation of Israel understood this. They understood all that was first belonged to the Lord. If you read books like Exodus and Leviticus, for those of you who are doing the Bible reading plan, you will know that everything that opened the womb, everything that was first belonged to God. We cannot offer what is first without a clear understanding of who is first. Let me say that again to us. We cannot offer what is first without an understanding of who is first. That brings us back to the Lordship principle of Christ, the supreme authority. If we know what to do with our finances first, it will determine the last. And obviously what we do first with our money determines how long it will last. When you go to the book of Genesis chapter 4, you can read about Abel who brought his superlative best. He brought, the Bible says in Genesis 4 verse 4, he brought of the firstborn of his flock and their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering. Not so with Cain. The respect was given to the offerer first and then the offering. When you present a tithe, when you return a holy tithe, when you present a first fruit, and when you bring an offering, the offering is actually a representation of the heart of the offerer. That's why the New Testament would speak about God loving a cheerful giver. By the time you get to the book of Hebrews, hundreds of years later, the Bible says in the book of Hebrews 11 verse 4, by faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice through which he obtained witness that he was righteous. Abel's offering was seen as one that was more excellent. When you read 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul was speaking to the Corinthians in the context of all the gifts. And then he says, I present to you a more excellent way. 1 Corinthians 12, 31, he says, yet I show you a more excellent way. The more excellent way is the way of love. Abel offered what was first. He offered a superlative best. It came from the posture of a heart that was after God. A heart that had a love for God. 
Now, when you read about the Lord Jesus Christ, you will find out that he offered himself as a first fruit. In Revelation chapter 14, from verse number four, uh, verse number one through to five, the Bible will say to us, Then I looked, and behold, a lamb, stand, a lamb standing on Mount Zion. And with him, this is a governing company, a company of 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. And verse 3 would tell us they sang, as it were, a new song before the throne. These were the ones who had not defiled themselves with women. And verse uh, 4, the second part says, These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes, bearing fruits or being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Watch the ruling, governing company of people, the remnant company that stand on Mount Zion. The Bible says the Father's name are written on their foreheads. And that is a picture of a people who have different thinking patterns. They sang a song. This was a new song, a song that was different. This is not just singing the song, but your entire life becoming a song. They were redeemed from the earth. This is a people that are not confined and defined by a worldly Egyptian system. They were not defiled by women. That means they did not uh, operate with, with any form of unrighteousness. They were operating with purity. They follow the Lamb. That means they are led by the Lamb. They are led by the nature of the Lamb. And they are the first fruits to God and to the Lamb. This is key because whilst there was an offering of the first fruit, there was a people that became a first fruit company unto the Lord. Whilst we offer the first fruit, we must also display the character of the ones who are the first fruit. You know, we can really only offer who we are. We can really off only offer who we are. When you read uh, Proverbs chapter 3 in verse number 9 and 10, it says, Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruit of all your increase. Now, money is seen oftentimes as seed. Seed is something that is sown, whilst money is something that is given. But when you give money and it takes on the form of seed, it is not the money in terms of rands, euros, dollars that you give. It is the ingredient with which you give it. So here the Bible is saying, honor the Lord. Honor the Lord. This releasing of an offering, of a first fruit, of a tithe, is actually coming from a place of honor the bible says in verse 10 once this is done this is now what happens fruitfulness takes place when you honor the lord with your possessions with the first fruit of all your increase verse 10 says so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine this speaks of abundance in terms of the word and the spirit and we're going to speak more of that in coming weeks of how the lord will Trust us with true riches, which is the word and the spirit. So as we offer unto the Lord this first fruit, as we offer to the Lord and as we honor the Lord, the scripture is saying to us, abundance will become part of our lifestyle. We can only offer what we have because of who we are in Christ Jesus. Whilst we give the first fruit, whilst we offer offerings, the demand is to become the offering as we offer it. When you look at the life of our Lord Jesus Christ, from birth through to death, money transacted around Christ. At his birth, in Matthew chapter 2, the... Wise men came, and the Bible will say they brought presents in terms of gold, 
frankincense and myrrh that was at his birth in Matthew 2 11 before his burial the woman came with a very costly bottle of spikenard or an alabaster flask Matthew 26 7 would say this woman came to him having an alabaster flask of very costly fragrant oil and she poured it on his head as he sat at the table so at his birth they bring gold, frankincense and myrrh. When he is, before his burial, there is the anointing with this costly spikenard. And then for his betrayal in Matthew 26, one of the twelve called Judas Iscariot went to the chief priest. And this is what he said. This is in the betrayal of Christ. He says, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? Sometimes we can be just like Judas. We can betray the source of money because of our love for it. So Jesus in his birth, in his uh, burial, in his betrayal, and then even in his burial and resurrection, there is money transacting. You can read in Matthew 27 from verse 57, the Bible speak of when evening came, a rich man came from Arimathea named Joseph, who also being a disciple of Christ, this man went to Pilate, asked for the body. Pilate commanded the body be given to him. And when Joseph of Arimathea had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean cloth, laid it in his new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock. And he rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb and departed. Joseph of Arimathea was a wealthy man and he needed to purchase or he needed a new tomb for the body. So you can see that from birth to burial, even in terms of his resurrection, there is money and wealth and resource that is transacting around Christ. And we must ensure that our wealth is transacting around Christ and his body, which is the church. Now what happens is, Joseph of Arimathea used his resource, the Bible says he was a rich man, and he used his resource to prepare this body for resurrection. And we want to see the body of Christ again rise. That is the church of Jesus Christ. We want to see the body rise in authority. We want to see the body of Christ rise up as a mighty army and nation on the earth. But it's going to take resource. And that resource is in our hands. Now, Galatians 3 and verse 29, it's a very interesting verse. It says, if you are Christ, that means if you belong to Christ, you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Abraham is a patriarch. When you read the book of Matthew chapter 1, the genealogy of Christ, you find Abraham being slotted in right at the beginning of the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when somebody is at the beginning, they're actually the foundation. So Abraham formed the foundation of this holy nation. And out of his lineage, the Christ was born on the earth. Now we must go back to the Genesis, to the beginning, and find out how patriarchs like Abraham transacted with wealth in the book of genesis chapter 13 the bible says then abram went up from egypt he and his wife and all he had and lot was with him to the south and abram was very rich in livestock in silver and in gold now livestock those of you who go out and do your meat shopping will know that livestock Silver and gold are not counted, but they are weighed. The word for rich in the original Hebrew is the word kabed. It means to be weighty, from where we would derive the word kabod, which means the glory. So a person who is actually rich carries a measure of glory. But the Bible tells us in Genesis 13 that Abraham went up from Egypt. And this is where he would acquire his wealth. And Egypt, which is a place of bondage, a place where there is Pharaoh, where there is uh, yokes that are placed upon us, 
It is a place where you will have taskmasters. It is a place that is much like the Babylon and the systems of the world that we have today. But Abram knew how to come up out of Egypt wealthy. So when you go into the systems of this world, like the nation of Israel did in their exodus, they were able to plunder Egypt. You have to devise systems in terms of how you come out of Egypt, but come out weighty and wealthy. We are the firstborn sons of God. And when we come out of Egypt and Egyptian bondage, we must come out of, of, out of these systems wealthy and rich. This means you carry glory. In Genesis chapter 13 and verse 3, the Bible says, And he went on his journey from the south even to Bethel. So here is Abraham. He's moving from Egypt. Watch this movement. Watch this migration. He moves from Egypt, but he moves with his wealth to Bethel. And Bethel is the house of God. It is important because this is the place of first things. It is a place where the womb will be opened. Most importantly, we must understand that whilst we will transact with wealth in the house of God, to the house of God, we must also understand that we are the house of God. So when we are transacting with wealth, we understand that we are are the house of God. In verse 4 it says, Unto the place of the altar, which he made there at the first. So once the money or the wealth is moving from Egypt, it then comes to Bethel, and from Bethel it moves to the altar. The altar is seen as the place of positioning and direction. It is the place of sacrifice. It is the place where many of the patriarchs, many of the prophets, like Elijah, when you construct an altar, would call upon the name of the Lord. Wealth must move to the place of sacrifice. The resource that you have in your hand must come to the place of being sacrificially placed before the Lord. In verse 5, the Bible says, And Lot also went with Abram. In this movement, in this migration, as Abram begins to journey, he has someone with him who is a close relative, but his name is Lot. And the, na and the name Lot simply means a veil or a covering. Now you could have associations you could have relations with people that are a veil or a covering to your wealth and to your resource. These people can sometimes overshadow the purpose of wealth in your life. Lot also comes to the place where Abraham at times became a little sentimental, became a little emotional. And do you know that sometimes sentimental and emotional ties can really overshadow the true purpose of wealth in your life. Verse number 7 says, And there was a strife between the herdsmen of Abram's cattle and the herdsmen of Lot's cattle. As the wealth is increasing, strife and contention set in. This is the very nature of mammon, the spirit of mammon. Wherever there is strife and contention a lot of the time the root of the strife and contention even in the home the domestic unit is around wealth is around money is around finance and resource and how we use it or how we spend it it is very important and today i want to submit to us it is very imperative that we understand that wealth carries a spirit and god is also spirit and Jesus said, you cannot serve God and mammon. When mammon brings in this strife and contention, there is this veil and there is this covering 
over our wealth and our resource and then we don't really understand its true purpose. When there is strife, contention around the way we steward and manage finance and resource, then that resource or that money or finance controls us. By the time you get to verse 8, Abraham does a very mature thing. He says to Lot, let there be no strife, I pray, between me and thee, between my herdsmen and thy herdsmen, for we are brethren. Is not the whole land before us. Separate. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you depart to the right hand, I'll go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan. In fact, it was the well-watered plain of Jordan. Sometimes in your journey, separation must take place. This is what's taking place in the life of Abram. Separation from Lot. Sometimes you have to separate from a certain friend, a certain group of people, a certain, uh, a certain colleague maybe even in the marketplace. Because once the separation takes place, wealth finds its true purpose. Joseph had to separate from his family to manage the wealth of Egypt. Samuel had to be separated unto the Lord. He had to be consecrated. A Nazarite vow was taken for him to steward the great wealth of the nation. Sometimes to discover the true meaning and potential of our wealth, we have to allow for certain veils to be separated from us. The Bible says in Genesis 13 verse 14, and the Lord said unto Abram, after Lot had separated, Lift up your eyes, look from the place where you are, north, south, east, west, for all the land which you see I will give to you and to your seed. There's a very key thing that God is asking Abram to do. He's saying to him, Lift up your eyes. Lift up your eyes. Have a heavenly perspective don't just see from an earthly dimension yes lot has taken the well watered plains but i want you to lift up your eyes and he says i will give this to you and your seed now wealth is going to find its true purpose when it's passed on to the next generation abraham had no seed but he had wealth and we can have wealth, but have no seed. Egypt wants to kill the seed. Egypt wants to give you wealth, but wants to kill the seed. Only you and I, as sons of God, can produce seed. Our wealth is able to last when it becomes seed. Your wealth will last when it becomes seed. Now, we'll move on to verse 18 because we want to move on very quickly today. Abram moved his tent and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron. Verse 18 says he moved to Hebron. And as you move your wealth, you've got to come from Egypt. You've got to come to Bethel, the house of God. You've got to separate from, from Lot. You've got to build an altar. But you've got to bring the wealth to Hebron. Hebron is the place of joinings. Hebron is the place of covenant. We need a Hebronite community of people. A people who will come to covenant with God, not just with their mouths, but also with their resource. Abram's movement is to the place of covenant. We must know how to come to this place of covenant with our wealth. And right there in Hebron, his wealth is redefined. What does Abram do? The verse will tell us, verse 18 tells us, he builds an altar. The men who came to David, in 1 Chronicles chapter 12, they come to David and they say, we are yours, we are yours, O son of Jesse. These men who could keep ranks... They came with their resource. The Bible will tell us in verse 40 of 1 Chronicles chapter 12, the men of Issachar, Zebul and Naphtali, they brought food on donkeys and camels, mules and oxen, provisions of flowers and cakes and figs, 
cakes of raisin, wine and oil, oxen, sheep, for there was joy in Israel. They came to covenant with David, but they came with their wealth. All the disciples who joined Jesus came with their wealth. They came with their resource. The fishermen came with their nets. They brought their boats. Luke the doctor would have brought his stethoscope. Matthew the tax collector would have brought some of his wealth. This is the type of people we need. A Hebronite generation who can covenant with their wealth. The rich young ruler in Matthew chapter 19 could not do this. He went away very sad and sorrowful. In verse number 14, the Bible says, When Abram heard that his brother Lot was taken captive, he armed his strained men. The word armed is the word ruk. It means to pour in and to draw out. What was Abraham using his wealth for? He was using his wealth to train, to pour in, to resource other people. And the Bible says in verse 16, as Abraham would go back on rescuing, or go, back, go on to this mission of rescuing Lot and his family, the Bible says in verse 16, he brought back all the goods. Again, his brother Lot, his goods, the woman also, and the people. So he trained men, armed them, and then he rescues another. There is a society out there that needs to be rescued. There are people out there that need to be rescued. Financially, they need to be rescued. People need houses. People need education. And it is the church of Jesus Christ. Because remember, if you are Abram, if you are Christ, you are Abram's seed and heirs according to the promise. And Abram does this. He goes and rescues Lot. That's when you have purpose-driven wealth. Abram used his resource, his finance, to help another recover from his loss. Genesis chapter 14 will tell us that. Paul used a very strong word when he spoke to Timothy. He says, command the rich. Command those who have wealth. He says, command those, in 1 Timothy 6, 17, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty. This is what wealth can do. It can make you haughty. And then he says, not to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they may be rich in good works, ready to give and willing to share. Ready to give and willing to share. To share. I want to show you what happens when Abraham now is able to release this. In Genesis chapter 14 and verse 18, the Bible says, And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High. He blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he, Abram, gave him a tithe of all. When you have a movement of your wealth out of Egypt, bringing it to Bethel, to the house of God, bringing it to the altar, bringing it to the place where there is no strife and contention, going and rescuing Lot, when you are arming and training others, Melchizedek appears. Melchizedek is a picture of Christ. And Christ brings out bread and wine. All our wealth, when it finds its purpose, it must reveal Christ. This is where the tithe is mentioned for the first time. This is when the tithe really finds its true purpose. The tithe is offered with this understanding that the purpose of my wealth is now to show honor. It is at this place that the tithe becomes holy. By the time you get to Genesis chapter 15 
and verse number one. This is what the Bible says if you, in Genesis chapter 15 and verse number one. After Abraham has put in place so many structures with his wealth, the Bible says, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. Shield is an instrument that was used for protection. The great reward is a picture of remuneration or provision. The two things that people labor for in this earth is for protection and provision. God is saying to Abraham, because you have been faithful with your wealth, because it has moved along a certain pathway, along a certain trajectory, I will become your shield and your exceedingly great reward. In this context, he has just even returned the holy tithe. The tithe belongs to the Lord. It is holy. And it must be returned. It is not primarily given. You return what belongs to the rightful owner. That is the most basic form of our giving. And here, Abraham receives this, this commendation. But God is saying to him, do not be afraid. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. You can go on even to read in Genesis chapter 18, following these verses, the Lord says to Abram, I will make your name great. When you read Genesis chapter 18 and verse 19, God says, uh, I will not hide what I'm going to do from Abraham. And then he says, for I have known him. Genesis 18 verse 19, I have known Abraham. God saying, this word for, for know is yada. It means I've known this man intimately. I've known him relationally. I've known him experientially. And he says, I will not hide what I'm going to do from Abraham. God is saying, I'm willing to stake my reputation on this man called Abraham. Why? Why will God say all of this about Abraham? He is saying, Abraham will not misrepresent me. He will not bring the reputation of God into disrepute. The question is today, can God stake his reputation on us? Can God stake his reputation on us? We have a relationship with him. And we, by the Spirit, cry out, Abba, Father. There's a joking, there's a yoking to the Lord. God will do something great. I, I believe this very firmly. As we exit the ark. As we go into new normals, God is going to do something great when we can maintain his reputation on the earth. We have not really seen, my opinion, the mega, the macro, the supra of God. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard. It has not entered into our minds the thing that God has taught. The question is, can God stake his reputation on us? Remember, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Money and wealth in your hand as a son of God, for it to multiply, for you to become fruitful, it must be submitted to God. When it is submitted to him, that means it has his spirit over it. When it's not submitted to God, it is submitted to the spirit of mammon. And suffice to say, the possessor of wealth is possessed by the spirit of mammon. And when you come under the control of mammon, you seek to control others. And when you're under the control of mammon, you are consistently living in fear. You are living in fear of losing it. But when you are submitted to the father... When you live as a son, when you declare God is my father and I am his son, you are connected to a limitless source and you lose your fear for money and you lose your fear of money. Don't be self-consumed. If you want to be fruitful, don't be self-indulgent. Don't be selfish. Don't be a selfie generation. 
The abuse of riches in this generation is more frequent than the correct usage. I say to us today that the management of mammon, and we're going to talk about this from the scriptures in Luke chapter 16 in the coming days, the management of mammon can determine our levels of anointing. Whilst you have an abundance of resource, whilst you have resource, I urge you today to become one who is wise and prudent in the manner in which we would begin to steward it. As a son of God, you operate from the kingdom of God, not by the spirit or under the spirit of mammon. Mammon will buy and sell, but in the kingdom of God, as a son of the kingdom, you will sow. Mammon will cheat. Mammon will seek to bribe and become corrupt. In the kingdom of God, there is the giving and receiving. In fact, it's more blessed to give. Mammon hoards. In the kingdom, there is distribution. Mammon thinks me, my, and us. In the kingdom, we declare we, our, and us. The moment you can give something away, it no longer controls you. The moment you can release something, it will no longer control you. I did this last week and I will do it again. I will give us a few tips on how to be faithful with this thing that's called mammon. You see, friends, we cannot pray for us to be healed and not talk about eating healthy. We cannot preach deliverance without telling you how not to get into bondage. And today I pray that even as we revisit some of these thoughts in concluding our teaching for this morning, you will go back and you will revisit, you will look at your budgets, you look at household expenses, and now as a wise steward, begin to manage the fundings that are in your hand. How do you steward this resource? Number one, honor the Lord. Parents, I speak to you today as a servant of the Lord. If you want to see your children live a blessed life, if you want to see your children not beg for bread, I say to us in this hour, know how to honor the Lord. If one generation can get it right, we will pass on this spiritual lineage to our children. Honor the Lord with first fruits, with offerings, and with the last fruit or the tithe. Whilst we, in the beginning, will live by principles. These are all principles in the scriptures. You will graduate, like I said to us last week, to the place where we don't just live by the principles, but we live from the place where God is our priority. Secondly, don't spend more than you earn. Have a budget in place. And if you have your spouse, sit together, put a budget in place, even take a few minutes at the end of every month and do an audit on what was coming in and what was being spent. Thirdly, pay your debts on time. Owe no man anything. If there are questions, let's settle it. The Bible says if you owe someone something, leave your gift at the altar and go and settle it. Number four, Find out what are your needs and your wants. Do we really need satellite television? Number five, let's pay our taxes. It's painful to do that, but let's do that. Give to Caesar what's due to Caesar. Number six, have a value system in place. And by that, I, I, I've, I've dealt with this on numerous occasions when I speak to us on spending resource on things that we use every day number seven don't spend on things that don't reflect the kingdom of god we must purchase and acquire things that reflect the kingdom take care of every little detail from your motor car to your home start with a micro and god will give us the macro number eight is very important like joseph did plan and save for the future have a retirement annuity have an investment in place start even if it's a few hundred rands a month start a savings plan the government has a tax-free saving plan of up to 30,000 rand per annum we should take advantage of that number nine 
Never put your resource into a bottomless pit. Don't be in relationships with people that don't value you and the God that you serve. They don't respect the doctrine. They don't respect the pastor. They are like Jonah sleeping quietly in your boat. And you are in a storm. The time will come when you will have to throw Jonah overboard. And lastly, consult with experts. When making major financial decisions, purchasing of houses, cars, make sure that you consult with an expert. I pray today that God will strengthen you and that you will be fruitful and multiply even as we would exit the ark. Let's bow for prayers. Our Father, you're a good Father, a Father in whom there is no shadow of turning. Thank you that in your goodness and your love, you gave us the Lord Jesus Christ. Today, Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are our Lord. You are our supreme authority. And we come today and we submit to you. We pray today, Father, that our love for money will not betray you. We would know how to submit wealth and bring it under the Lordship of Christ. I pray that you would help us that our hands would reach, would stretch, would extend. Thank you, Father, that you have also given us your spirit. Holy Spirit, you are the spirit of wisdom. We need wisdom to steward. We need wisdom to manage every cent, every rand, every million rand that would come into our hands. Thank you, Father, today that it will have the spirit of God over it, not the spirit of mammon. I thank you today, Lord, for grace and strength that will come upon young men, young women. Thank you today, Father, that we would know how to leave an inheritance for our children's children. We would know how to transact with wealth in the house of God and as the house of God. We would know how to bring wealth and place it on the altar like Abraham. I ask you, Lord, for grace and strength to have this posture of the Lamb. To have the Father's name written on our foreheads. Lord, that we will function with the mindset of our Father. Thank you, Lord, today that we would know how to live in this world and not be of it. To come out of Egypt wealthy. I pray for grace, for wisdom, witty inventions, creative ideas to come to your children even at this critical time in the earth. Grant us the grace, Father, and the strength like you did to Joseph. Lord, we thank you there'll be wisdom that even Pharaoh will take notice of this measure of the anointing. I bless your children today and commit them to the word of your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, friends, God bless you. We pray that you will continue to be faithful to the Lord. And if you would like a copy of this message, uh, please feel free to get in contact with us and we'll be sure to get it through to you. Well, be safe. Many people are going out and behaving riotously and lawlessly. This virus is still with us. Hundreds of people are passing on. And I pray that you will still take all the necessary measures and keep all the protocols in place in your home and in the marketplace. The Lord bless you and may his grace be sufficient for you.